allowed our moments to roll on a little while longer, and we ought be glad. Certainly, he is to be praised, reverenced, respected, honored, and adored, for he's God and he's God alone, and besides him, there is none other. He sits high, looks low, he is in charge, he is in control, he orchestrates our affairs to bring us to his end, and certainly I'm thankful and appreciative that he has allowed me and you to see this moment. Certainly, uh, he has power to speak, man lay down and die, and he can speak again, and man will live. Amen. Amen. What we are, God brought us. What we know, he taught us. What we have, he gave it to us. And so, uh, we owe him all the honor and glory, praise, and worship. Amen. So good to see a few here today. Uh, thanks. Uh, I thank God for Deacon McLean uh, as he stands tall weekly uh, to devote our hearts to the study of God's word. Um, I say quite often that if you're going to journey in this life, you need four S's. Uh, you need scripture. You need sermons. Uh, you need songs and you need supplication. And certainly he has blessed us with song, supplication, and scripture. You ought to feel better now that uh, you have been devoted. So good to see Reverend Pope and Reverend McCoy and uh, Sister Mary Browning uh, here t tonight or this evening. And uh, it's good for me to be here. It's good to have you all on uh, tonight as you are a part of us, a part of the teaching section uh, virtually. We pray that God's word reach you and, and uh, motivate and encourage you in these hard and horrific times in which we live. What a time we had on Sunday. Um, predecessor preached out of his heart and stood tall and and uh, we had a chance to honor him and give him flowers while he's living. Uh, that's important. And I'm thankful that the Lord has allowed me to share in such a wonderful experience and wonderful occasion. Uh, he's well deserving. And, uh, and I'm just thankful that the city of Bessemer and all of the officials uh, of the city, elected officials, uh, and all of the members of New Bethlehem uh, shared in the celebration of Dr. William H. William H. Walker uh, as we have honored him for 40 plus years of laboring. He's still laboring. He said Sunday that he has forgot how to preach. I said, man, it's like riding a bicycle. Uh, once you learn, you don't forget it. You just need to uh, get in the saddle or get on the seat again, and you'll start pedaling. And that's what he did. He preached hard. God have mercy. And I loved every bit of it. So God bless you, Reverend Dr. Walker, and God bless you, New Bethlehem, and the city of Bessemer. Listen, we're in praying times, times of uh, hostility, times of hardness, times of... Um, contention, lots happening uh, with um, the police departments and lots happening in communities. But I don't want you to lose hope and I don't want you to lose focus. Uh, we're still about the saving soul business. Uh, people, people's souls need to be saved. And uh, I come to uh, preach and teach so that saves will be souls will be saved. That's first and foremost. Uh, it is God's will and God's desire and God's heart that none perish, but all be brought unto repentance. 
And how can you repent of something that hadn't been revealed to you? So the purpose of teaching is to reveal to us what's wrong with us. There's something wrong with all of us. Amen. Amen. We have not arrived. We have not attained. Uh, we have not reached the mark, uh, as Paul said. So we have some work to do, some praying to do, some teaching to do, so that through the teaching, he can wash us with his word and make us heaven ready. Amen. You need to be heaven ready. Uh, don't get so caught up in the earth that you lose focus of heaven and lose focus of, of the Lord. Um, and I hear you saying, well, don't get so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Amen. And I understand that there has to be a balance, but I'm not going to let the earth outweigh heaven. Amen. Now, you do whatever you want to, but now the way I'm doing, I'm focusing in on God because I know he's the only one who can change uh, what's going on in the earth. Amen. We don't have the power to change, and uh, we don't have the power to create peace. Peace is a gift that we receive from the Lord. He says, peace I leave with you. Peace I give unto you, not as the world give, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So we, we don't have the power to create peace. We have to receive peace. And we receive peace by receiving his spirit. I thought I would say that tonight because a lot of man uh, efforts are going to try to establish peace. As long as evilness and righteousness exists in the earth, there will be no absolute peace. As long as sin is in the earth, there will be no absolute peace. Amen. Amen. So uh, we have to receive the peace. And then that peace that he gives us is inner peace. Amen. Peace that guards your mind. Amen. Amen. Keep you settled while all of this chaotic stuff happening. That you don't be running around frantic and panicking, afraid. But you be settled. You be cool, calm, and collected. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the peace that he gives us. I thought I would say that. Now, listen, we come to the close of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, these final verses, verses 24 through 29 of Matthew chapter 7. Look with me, if you will, at Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. And tonight we're talking about foundational faith, uh, building up on the right foundation, foundational faith. That's what I have uh, titled this particular lesson, foundational faith. Uh, he, he, he will sh reveal to us in the lesson that there are different types. Uh, you can have surface faith. But surface faith cannot stand storms. You need foundational faith. And, and to have foundational faith, you have to dig deep. There's depthness to your faith. Amen. So let's look at it. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, 
and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And he, and he, and he puts emphasis on the, the, the fall of the house, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Amen. The word of the Lord for the people of God. The word is blessed. May we be blessed by being hearers and doers of his holy word. It is in these commencing verses of Matthew chapter 7 that we discover that both the saved and the unsaved experience storms. That storms do not discriminate. God does not discriminate in allowing storms. We back up a few chapters in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, it says, For he, being God, makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends his rain on the just and on the unjust. So God does not discriminate in allowing storms. That he allows both the saved and the unsaved to experience storms. Get that in your spirit. The rains of life falls on the righteous and unrighteous. Every one saved or unsaved experienced storms. Please understand me. And please understand that your storms have purpose. Let me say that again. Your storms have purpose. Storms of life are tools to test the foundation of your faith. You don't know what you have until it is tested. A faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. So God allows storms to come our way. He allows us to experience storms to test our faith. I mean, think about it. That's what Peter talks about. That troubles and trials and tribulations come about in life and serves as a type of fire to purify our faith. There's purpose. In the storms we experience. A few weeks ago, I had the privilege of visiting and viewing one of the fine homes Sister Regina Williams built. In conversation with Sister Williams, she said to me, the most important part of a house is the foundation. The solidity of the foundation determines the security of the house. Beauty, listen to this, is secondary to foundation. 
making sure the foundation is right to bear the weight of the house is first and foremost. Because the foundation determines the durability of the house. Wow. Wow. The same holds true about your life, your faith, your spiritual walk with the Lord. The most important aspect of your life is the foundation of faith. It, it is not how good your faith looks. But, but rather, what can your faith handle and how durable is your faith? You know, think about it. A whole lot of people look good. They can even act good while things are smooth in their life. While the surface of life is smooth, but let a few rough places come about. Let them experience a few turbulences along the flight of life. That good looking faith turn, sometimes turn ugly. Uncertain. Do I have a witness? It is not how good your faith looks. But rather what can your faith handle? And how durable is your faith? You, you can have good looking faith that fizzles before the finish. Shatters in storms. You need firm, solid faith that is anchored on the rock. That's key. Now, Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount with a depiction of two builders. One is wise and the other is foolish. One built on a rock while the other built on sand. The difference between these two builders is the foundation upon which they have built their houses. The two builders, get this, represent everyone who hears the words of Jesus. After hearing the word of God, after hearing the words of Jesus, you will either be wise or foolish. There's nothing in between. There are no categories between the two. You'll either be wise or foolish. Wise or foolish in the way you live your life. Wise and foolish in what you're building your life with and building your life upon. You either be wise or foolish. And of course, through the teachings of Christ, Christ wants us to be wise. He doesn't want, our, he doesn't want us to live our lives as fools or foolishly. He wants us to be wise. That's what the word says. Be wise as a serpent. Harmless as a dove. He wants us to build our lives the right way. Build to last. Build to last. Here it is. Foundational faith. He starts with verse 24. And 25, and he, and, he, and he talks about hearing and doing Jesus' word is wise building. Now, make sure you take note of that hearing and doing Jesus' word is wise building. Jesus said in verse 24 and 25, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. Verse 25 says, Then the rain descended, and the floods came, 
and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. Now, first of all, he talks about the importance of hearing the word of God. It is important to hear the word of God. Now, the word hear means more than mere, merely listening. It implies both a grasp of what is intended by the statements made and agreement in the truth. So to hear is more than just to give your ear to noise or to give ear to utterances, to give ear to words. It's to grasp. It's to attentively hear and to intake what's heard and agree with what's been said. So, so, so it's more than just to merely listen. You know, uh, sometimes we, we, we can hear people talking to us but really not hear them. We know they're saying something, but something else has our attention. And because our attention is somewhere else, we are hearing them say something, but we are not really tuned in to what they are saying. Jesus is saying to hear his teaching is to receive it, to grasp it, and to agree with it. Lord help me. To agree with it. It's an agreement in the truth. See a lot of people come to church and hear the word but they don't agree. They leave in disagreement. Nothing ever changes because they are not in agreement. They hear and don't hear. Or they hear and don't agree. <laughs> but Jesus says to hear, you have to grasp what is intended by the statements made and agreement in the truth. I like what he said in John chapter 5, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say unto you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Let me say that again. He says, truly, truly, surely, surely, I say unto you, whoever hears my word, grasp my word agree with my word that's where this believes him who sent me has eternal life so Jesus said it is important for us to hear the word of God Paul in Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I, I like what Paul said in Romans chapter 10 because he gives a string of questions. How can you believe in him in whom you have not heard? How can you hear without a preacher? And how can he preach except he be sent? So, if you will hear the word of God, hearing the word of God begins to build your faith, develop faith in you. You don't have faith outside of hearing. You have to hear the word of God. You have to grasp the word of God and agree with the word of God. 
Now, it's important to hear. It's important to hear. But now Jesus didn't just leave it at hearing, grasping, grasping the word and agreeing with the word. He says the word must become action in your life. It is something you have to do. So it's important not only to hear the word, but it, it is also important to do the word of God. Now here it is, Jesus warns his followers that to have heard his words is useless unless they put them into practice. Let me say that again. He warns his followers that to have heard his words is useless unless they put them into practice. Can you imagine, well, let me say it this way. Can you just consider for a moment how many People live useless lives as it relates to the kingdom of God. Hear words Sunday after Sunday, Tuesday after Tuesday, Wednesday after Wednesday, even uh, daily devotionals that come to their phones and they're reading a lot, they're hearing a lot, but doing very little. Jesus said it is useless to just hear it and not do it. See, the word of God is designed to change us, to alter the way we live, to alter the way we think. The word of God is, 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 is designed to wash us and make us better and to make us more like Christ every day. He wants us to do. He wants us to do. So he gives us his word to do. James, the brother of our Christ, in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17 says, What does it profit, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you say to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 said that salt is useless if it does not flavor, if it does not preserve. So there is purpose in faith. That if we have faith in God, he gives us a purpose that we are to live out in the earth. And if we are not living out the purpose, we are useless to God. Help me teach this now. He doesn't want us to be useless. He wants us to be useful. So we hear the word to do the word. Hear the word to do the word. We stop arguing with the word. Uh, the word says forgive, forgive. Hear the word to do the word. The word says go extra miles, stop just going one. Hear the word to do the word. The word says esteem others more highly than yourself. Do the word. Hear it and do it. The purpose of you hearing it is for you to do it. And he says, when you do it, notice...
that he says that you are like a wise builder. He says when you hear the word and do the word, you have stability. Lord, help me. Oh, my. There's stability. We got too many unstable folk. We like the chef that the wind blows. No, no, you need some stability. You need to be settled in the word and, and in your faith. And, and he says, when you, when you hear the word and you do the word, he likens you unto a wise builder. In other words, you're not surface in your living. There's some depthness to your life. There's some stability. Now, notice wise builders. Wise builders practice the word of God. Jesus says, you're like a wise builder. If you do, wise builders practice the word of God. You become a rock builder. You, you, you engage in building upon the rock. But now, rock building is not surface building. And the rock, according to Jesus in Luke chapter 6, is not on the surface. Help me, Lord, teach this. To build on the rock requires rigorous effort. He says, he that will build on the rock will dig deep. You must dig deep to lay the foundation on a rock. And the rock is Jesus himself. There's nothing shallow about Jesus. He's deeper than deep. Tougher than tough. You have to spend some time to know him. You can't be casual. You have, to, you have to really put forth some effort. You got to deny yourself some stuff. You got to get some alone time with him in the word. You got to intensify your prayer life. That's digging deep. Uh, you got to read. You got to attend church as you should. Sunday school and Bible study and, and, and worship service on a regular basis. You can't be casual. And on every now and then attendee you need to put forth effort when you get home after all of that you have to still push away the plate sometime and and pull the bible to you to read that's digging deep on your way to work on your way to different places you need to tune in to biblical stations and get rid of all of that stuff of the world so you can you can dig deep and your life can have some stability he says you, you, you have to dig you have to dig down to the rock there's nothing surface about the rock it requires rigorous effort get this the rock is Jesus the teachings of Jesus because Jesus says he that heareth these sayings of mine so his teaching serves as the rock Jesus himself is the rock and only the life founded upon and guided by the principles of Jesus Christ shall stand Let me say that again. Only the life founded upon and guided by the principles of Christ shall stand. Jesus says the wind or the rains, floods, and winds blow and beat upon good Christian folk. People that's very committed and dedicated 
to Christ. He says the winds, the rains, and the floods <laughs> beat up on people who pay their tithes, people who come to Sunday school and Bible study. We have to go through too. Just think about this whole pandemic, this, this, this whole season of pandemic. I mean, it's affecting good and bad people. Everybody is affected by this. Even the saved is affected by this. We go through storms, rains, Floods and winds represent the fierce storms from above, beneath, and all around. Life storms are collectively the trials, the temptations, and persecution which comes upon us from without. There comes a time that every life, to every life, when these things throng together and test the foundation of our faith. You really don't know the foundation of your faith until you experience one of the dreadful storms of life. That's when you know. See, some people are sitting back watching to see if you're going to be standing after the wind storm is over. They know what you're going through. They sit back watching to see how you're going to look on this side of the storm. They know what it's like on this side. Came to church shouting. You came to church, you know, witnessing to the preaching. And then a storm hit. And, and, and they're watching to see if you're going to be about the same business you were about before the storm hit. Watching you to see what you built on. And when you're wise and you're building, when the storm is over, when the mist and the dust settles, you still standing. I can remember in 05, my dad died, Thomas Sr. died. And uh, he made me promise him that I would preach his funeral if he joined my church. And I promised him that I would. And um, after he died, I had to honor the promise. And I didn't have a problem. And I had many to ask me, how could you do that? I said, well, I could do it because I counsel other people when they go through the same storm. And if the word that I shared with them worked for them, it ought to work for me. It came from my mouth. <laughs> people watching to see if you built on the right stuff. If you built on the right somebody, and that right somebody is Jesus, they're watching to see if you're going to last. They know you just got laid off your job. They know it's a pandemic and your unemployment is about to run out. They know your child just got arrested and got a court appearance date. They know Junior just dropped out of school and, and, and it just goes on and on they know you got more month than you got money they just watch you to see if you gonna stand if you gonna be standing when the storm is over and he says what determines whether or not you be standing when the storm is over is what you built on you got to put in some work. You got to spend some time with the Lord. Digging deep to get to the rock. 
This is the last of it. He, 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 he deals with hearing and not doing Jesus' word is foolish building. Verses 26 and 27, he says, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Listen to him. Everybody know that this life is a disaster. There's something about ignoring the word of God that will bring you to ruins. Just to hear it and to reject it, to hear it and to refuse to obey it will bring your life to ruins. I know how it starts out. It starts out quick. It starts out good. It starts out you being on top. It starts out with you seemingly having made in the shade. Like everything is going well for you. You know, think about even Psalm 37 and Psalm 73 and 37. David talks about fretting not at the prosperity of the wicked. And then Asaph in Psalm 73 says his feet almost slipped from under him while he was watching, looking over the fence at the prosperity of the wicked. He says, until he went into the house of God. And it was revealed in the word. The word of God carries, it covers every aspect of life. That what starts out good may not end good. That things can change. Circumstances can change. Life storms can change some things for you. Now, he, he, he deals with what he has already dealt with in verses 25 and 26, but in a negative way in verses 26 and 27. Sand represents ignoring Jesus' teaching. It, it represents ignoring Jesus' teaching, ignorance of Jesus' teaching. Christ is not to be found on the surface. When he teaches the word, when he shares the word, you have to receive the word and agree with the word. And you have the responsibility of hiding it in your heart. So you can live your life accordingly. I like that. He says, if you don't do it after you hear it, hear it. If you don't do it, he says he likens you unto a foolish builder. You built your house on sand. It looks good. Looks real good. I mean, everybody wants beachfront property. You know, looks good. Sand result you. Oh my, it looks real nice and lovely. It looks comfortable. But it too shall be tested. The winds will blow, the rain will descend, and the floods will come and sweep it away. So after the storm, what was is no more. It's gone because the flood swept it away. Now, Jesus, when he finished these sayings, the crowd was, the crowds were astonished at his doctrine. No, notice Jesus taught doctrine. Some people say they don't believe in doctrine. The Bible is a doctrine. 
It's the teachings of. It's the word of God. Doctrine. So, so the word doctrine simply means teaching. It's the teachings of. It's given to us to teach us of God, to teach us of Jesus Christ, to teach us of the Holy Spirit, and to teach us how to relate to them. Doctrine. Jesus taught doctrine. You can't be Christian without doctrine, without teaching. So, so they were astonished because Jesus... His teaching, his, or he taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. So the scribes were the learned men and teachers of the Jewish nation. They would read a passage and then teach what various other rabbis had to say about the passage. However, Jesus teaches, teaches with authority. He didn't need the commentary of rabbis, the opinion of people. He taught with authority. He was open, plain, grave, useful, delivering truth as it became the oracles of God not spending his time in tri uh, trifling disputes and debating questions of no importance. Jesus showed that he had authority to explain, enforce, and change the ceremonial laws of the Jews. He came with authority, such as no man could have. And it is not remarkable that his explanations astonish them. Because when Jesus speaks, God is speaking. See, that's my prayer. Lord, when I stand to preach, when I stand to teach, when I open my mouth, I pray that you speak through me. So that the word of God will be authoritative. It will confront, convict, to change lives. Amen. That's how Jesus ended this sermon on the mount. With the depiction of two builders. And this is what all of us, every one of us, were either wise or foolish and I'd rather be wise I hear and I do and I encourage you to hear and do put it in place in your life let it be the rule of your life the guiding star the compass of your life let it lead and guide you. Don't just read it and ignore it. That's foolish. Read it and apply it. God bless you. Father in heaven, we thank you again today for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, the joy of experiencing this journey through um, the Sermon on the Mount, allowing us to sit with you spiritually as you sat and taught on the side of that hill. Lord, we have received many, many principles, many things to do and things that we should not do. We hear you, and we will do. Because, Father, we want to be wise. We want to build our lives 
on your son, Jesus Christ. Bless us as we preach and teach the lost to follow you. Give power to our proclamation, spirit to our service, that the glory will be unto you, Father. Thank you for what you have done with us and through us already. And we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Preachers?